You are listening to the Thoughts from a Page podcast, which is a member of the Evergreen Podcasts Network. My name is Cindy Burnett, and I love to talk about books with anyone and everyone. While listening to my podcast, you will hear author interviews, behind-the-scenes conversations about various aspects of the publishing world, theme discussions with other book lovers, and more. For more book recommendations and a complete list of all of my interviews, check out my website, thoughtsfromapage.com, and follow me on Facebook and Instagram at Thoughts From a Page. In 2022, I would love for you to join my Patreon group. I offer at least two bonus episodes a month and a monthly advanced read and pre-publication author chat. For those on Facebook, I host a special Patreon Facebook group where we all chat books. Thanks so much to those who already participate, and I hope you will consider joining us. Today, I am chatting with Eleanor Brown about any other family. Eleanor is the New York Times bestselling author of the novels The Weird Sisters and The Light of Paris and the editor of the anthology A Paris All Your Own. An adoptive mother herself, Eleanor lives with her family in Colorado. Any Other Family will be in my top 10 reads of 2022. It's just a phenomenal book. I hope you enjoy our conversation. And now for a quick break. For the last year, I have been focusing more on my health and eating habits. In connection with that, I have started drinking AG1 in the morning. When I started drinking AG1 daily, I could feel a real difference in my health and energy levels. That is because AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that supports your body's universal needs like gut optimization, stress management, and immune support. Since 2010, AG1 has led the future of foundational nutrition, continuously refining their formula to create a smarter, better way to elevate your baseline health. I recommend AG1 to all of my family and friends because the company has a team of doctors and scientists. It is tested for 950 contaminants and is NSF certified for sport. It is formulated based on the latest science, and it maintains high quality standards. Thanks AG1 for sponsoring my show. AG1 is a supplement I trust to provide the support my body needs daily. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash thoughts from a page. That's drinkag, the number one, dot com slash thoughts from a page. Check it out. And now back to my show. Welcome, Eleanor. How are you today? I'm fabulous. How are you, Cindy? I am fabulous as well because I absolutely adored your book. It will definitely be in my top 10, probably my top two or three of the year. So I cannot wait to talk about it. Oh, thank you so much. That's so kind of you to say. Just such a wonderful, wonderful story. Unique, but also just kind of wrapped in so many different things that we all deal with day to day. And then there's all this wonderful humor. So really, it's just the perfect book. Oh, good. I hope you're not alone in thinking that. Thank you. (laughs) I definitely am not. I've already seen people posting about it, and I've been pushing it into my friends' hands that are early reviewers, and all the feedback has been great. Oh, good. I do not read reviews, and I am no longer on social media, so it's very funny. I I kind of live in this bubble, but it's really nice then, because when someone like you says, I really liked your book, I'm like, oh, you read my book? That's a (laughs) good You know, that's interesting that you said that about social media, because I did post at one point, I think when I was reading it, and I couldn't find you anywhere. And I was yeah. like, I guess she's not on social media. Well, good for you. <laughs> well, you know, I was when when my first book was published many moons ago, you know, it was you had to blog and you had to be on social media. This isn't healthy for me as a human being. It's not healthy for me as a writer. I don't know that it's healthy for our national discourse. And then I thought for sure they were going to say, you need to get back on. And they were like, no, if you don't want to be part of, you know, that conversation, you don't have to be. And I was like, fine, I want to like put my my brain in my books. (laughs) Um, So uh, I miss it a little bit. I miss the camaraderie and and the conversation. But yeah, there's a sort of peace and calm to my life without it. I get that. I just do it for books. And I pretty much ignore, I mean, like my Personal Facebook, I'll share some book stuff and I keep up with friends. But anytime anything gets rocky, I just move on past that. And on Instagram, I just have the Bookstagram account. But I can see as an author, it's a little different. And there's been a lot of conversation in the last, I don't know, several years about, you know, tagging authors in bad reviews or stumbling mm-hmm. across a bad review. So I can see where there's just, and not that you're going to have bad reviews, but I can see where you would not want to do that. No, no. I mean, and and again, everybody's different. I do think, you know, for me, it's like once the lesson that my first novel taught me is that once your book is out in the world, it doesn't belong to you anymore. 
And I think that there are a lot of authors who have a difficult time letting go and they want to still like monitor. And I understand like it's your baby, you know, you're putting it out there in the world that represents your blood, sweat and tears and your time and all those things. But I also think that, you know, trying to, to follow conversations about your book or reading good re- reviews or Amazon reviews of your book is just a way of trying to maintain some sense of control over it. But I really would just rather give it to readers and let them create their own experience with it. I like that. And I think, like you said, it's going to happen either way. So you might as well just let it head on out into the world and try not to worry about it anymore. Exactly. Exactly. It's yours now. And I love, I talk to a lot of book clubs and uh, I love sort of hearing their experiences with the book because one of the things I love about this is that, you know, we all read the same book, but we all read different books. And so it's just really interesting to me just to kind of be like, okay, you go have your own experience with this story. And I think that's going to particularly be the case with this book for a variety of reasons. The adoption angle, the different mothers, what it is to be a mother, all of that together. What what the idea of family. I mean, I think there's a lot that you've brought into this story. And so definitely based on everyone's own personal history, they're going to be reading a slightly different book. Right, absolutely. And it really does, you know, it makes me happy to hear that the the book is very centered around adoption, because that was the issue that I wanted to explore. It was the core of the questions that I had. But I really tried to bring a lot of other things into it. And kind of the best things I've heard are from people who aren't parents, and yet they still found the book interesting and engaging and were able to relate to it in some way. And that's when I know that I have you know, accomplished something that that people can get something out of it, even if it doesn't reflect their own personal experience. I think that's exactly right. Well, I usually ask authors at the very beginning to talk a little bit about their book, but we've been chatting a little bit already, but I'd still love for you to provide a summary for those that won't have read it yet. So Any Other Family is the story of three sets of parents who adopt biological siblings. There's three sets of parents and four kids. And so they kind of create their own family because they agree they want these children to grow up as siblings, even though they're not being raised in the same home. And they all go away together for their first annual or last annual, depending on who you're, who you're talking to, family vacation. And while they're there, they get a call from their children's birth mother and she tells them she's pregnant again and asks them if they will help her find a family for this child she is expecting. I just loved the concept of this story. It is so unique, or at least I found it very unique. And I love that you had the three sets of parents, particularly the mothers, because as a mother, I could identify with them. And I love the adoption angle. And I know that's personal for you. So can we talk a little bit about the inspiration for the story? Sure, absolutely. So four years ago in 2018, I got a call late at night from my OBGYN. And I don't know about you, but my doctor doesn't usually call me at nine o'clock at night. So I was a little surprised. And she said to me, listen, I have a woman. She came in for her annual exam yesterday. And it turns out she's six months pregnant. And she wants to make a plan for adoption. Do you want a baby? And I don't know about you, but I've never had anyone call me and offer me a human being before. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking that. Do you want a baby? Well, it's not like, do you want to go to dinner? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, my husband and I hadn't had kids for any number of reasons. And we were old. And so we kind of thought that door had closed. But we had a long conversation and we met with our son's birth mother and then met with his birth father. And we decided to do it. And so we have this wonderful, and he's now four, and we have an open adoption with his birth family, both his birth parents and their extended families as well. Uh, And that's something that's unusual. It's becoming more common. It is not always possible or recommended. It's not always, you know, safe emotionally for everybody. But in our case, it is absolutely. And we know that it is better for the child if it is possible to do it. It can be really, really healthy for them. But I think a lot of people's experience with adoption, their thoughts about adoption are a little bit outdated. They're very used to closed adoptions where there was no contact between the biological family. Sometimes the child wasn't even told they were adopted. That was what we thought was best psychologically for a long time, even though it really was not. 
Uh, and so I wrote this book because I had all these questions about adoption and what makes a family and how do you forge relationships with people when you've really been brought together by accident. And um, I gave all those questions to the people in this book and said, you guys figure it out because I don't know the answers. That's so interesting on talking about adoption and how much it's changed and that a lot of times kids weren't told they had been adopted. But going even farther back, a lot of times people sort of viewed adoption as something embarrassing. And I think that's the other reason they sometimes didn't tell their children or didn't tell others because they didn't want to admit that they had adopted someone, which is crazy and seems so crazy to us today. But I know it was the prevailing thought decades ago. Right. And then, of course, there's the flip side of that, which is the uh, birth mothers, you know, who when unplanned pregnancies, pregnancies out of wedlock, you know, whatever the situation was, when that was thought of as something wrong or inappropriate, uh, you know, I know you, that you're going to ask for book recommendations. So one of the books I'll recommend is a book called The Myth of Surrender by Kelly O'Connor McNeese which is about maternity homes in the 1960s, where young girls were sent and they were basically, you know, forced to hide during their pregnancies, often drugged during delivery, and they never saw their children um, and their children were adopted by other families. So I think that kind of the secrecy is on both sides of the equation. There was like secrecy and shame uh, about it on both the adoptive family side and then the birth family side. And, and I really hope that we've moved beyond that. No, that is certainly right. And women who then never told a soul other than their immediate family that they had given birth, so they would be in you know another relationship, married, children, and then they don't really want someone showing up. Or maybe they do eventually. But yes, there's just a lot that went into all of that. And thankfully, it does seem like we moved well past all of that. Yeah, although they do, they do still exist. There was actually a great article in the Washington Post a few weeks ago about a maternity home in Texas that still... It operates a little bit differently, but it's definitely definitely a situation that's still ongoing. So we still need, we have lots of work to do on adoption, on unplanned pregnancy, all that stuff. Well, and with the recent case overturning Roe v. Wade, a lot of that is going to also be shifting. Mm -hmm. It is. I mean, it's actually been this interesting issue in the adoptive community because especially with COVID over the past few years, so adoption or like adoptable infants in particular, that rate has declined over the years for a handful of reasons. One of them is growing acceptance of single parenting or parenting again out of wedlock. That sounds like such a, an ancient phrase to say, but I'm not coming up with a, a more modern one right now. So, you know, so that, that, and that is wonderful because we definitely uh, want children, if it's healthy to, you know, to, to be raised by their, their birth families, if they can be. Um, but then COVID was this whole issue because people were not getting within six feet of each other. <laughs> it's harder to have children. It's harder to have children. It is harder to, you know, run into these these unplanned pregnancies. So it was very funny. And it was kind of one of my thoughts was, okay, well, what's going to, you know, what's going to happen now to that? So I don't know, big, big question marks in lots of directions. I'd be very curious to see how it all plays out. The three adoptive mothers are very distinct characters. Did you have to work hard to make them each unique or was it easy to find a personality for each of them? And then do you see yourself in each of them or is there one in particular you identify with? So I think of myself as a character driven writer. That's really what brings me to story is that I am very interested in people and why they act the way they do and what are what are the forces that shape us along the way. So it wasn't really hard to come up with two of them. So Tabitha uh, and Elizabeth, it was very easy. I knew exactly who they were. I was very interested with Tabitha. There's this part of me that wants to be the Pinterest mom, you know, who has to do everything perfectly. And, you know, we have to have the perfect craft and I have to be the one who brings the, the best snack into school. And so she... Uh, she was kind of easy to come up with. And then Elizabeth, on the other end, I was really interested in anger in women and the way in which anger comes out, because it's not something that as women, we are socialized to do. But Elizabeth is really angry. And that anger is covering up some other emotions. But 
I was just super interested in that. So I kind of had the core for both of them. Ginger was harder. I'll give you a little writerly tidbit, which is that I use the Enneagram a lot to create my characters. Are you familiar with the Enneagram? I know what it is. I haven't ever gone and done my own, but I do see people posting about it all the time. Okay. So it's for for people who don't know, it's kind of like Myers-Briggs. It's a personality theory. I find it a little more accessible than than Myers-Briggs, but it's that same idea. And so I tend to use Enneagram types to help me build characters just because it helps me, again, understand not what people do, but why they do what they do. And so I relied a lot on that uh, in building the characters. So Ginger was the mother who was a little bit trickier because I don't even know why she was so tricky. I think I just kind of struggled to find the right role for her and the right balance for her because I had these two very extreme personalities and who was I going to pair with them? Um, So I think they're all a little bit me. Uh, People always ask me, they ask me with the weird sisters, which one is you? That was my first novel with The Light of Paris, which was my second, which one are you? And I think I'm always all of my characters. And that's the fun thing about writing is you get to explore different parts of yourself. And I hope that readers see a little bit of themselves in all the characters too. I most definitely did. I could identify with all three of them on different issues, just different parts that I completely saw myself there. Oh, that's so good. That that makes me really, really happy to hear. And I do think, I mean, again, right, we all bring these different parts of ourselves to what we're reading. And it's the same thing on the flip side. It's the same with what we're writing. I think that's exactly right. What about telling the story in alternating points of view? Did you set out to do that? Was it always going to be that way? Or did that change as you wrote? No, it was always going to be that way. I really, all of my books work that way in in sort of different styles. But with this one, I knew that I wanted to get kind of pack as many ideas into this book as possible. And so to do that, I really wanted to share these experiences, right? Because just like families are all different, adoptive families are all different. And so, you know, this woman's experience with adoptive motherhood is not this woman's experience with adoptive motherhood is not this woman's experience with motherhood, period, right? And so I definitely wanted to give each of them the opportunity to explore that and then give the reader opportunities to think about these issues from different angles. Because my hope is that people will come to this and there are times when they will agree with some of the mother's decisions or thoughts and sometimes when sometimes they won't. But it's really important to me. I think one of the gifts of fiction in particular, but really any story, is being able to experience other people's points of view, right? To experience the world through someone else's lens. And I don't always like (laughs) these women or the choices they make or the things that they do. But that's not really why why I wrote the story. I didn't write the story so we could hang out with people we liked. I wrote the story because I wanted us to hang out with people we love and sometimes like. Well, just like our friends and our family, I mean, you definitely love people, but you don't love every single thing they do or say. Exactly, exactly. What about the interspersed adoption application paragraphs? I guess that's what you'd call them. I thought that was fascinating. And at first I was kind of like, what am I reading? And then I caught on and I love that. Was that something you planned to do from the beginning? Yes, that was also uh, sort of a plan from the beginning. Again, I, I wanted to give a lot of perspective. One of the things that I discovered when I became part of the adoptive community is, you know, people come to adoption in all kinds of ways and for all kinds of reasons. And I think we have this very singular narrative of, you know, people come to adoption because they have fertility issues, right? And that's the end of the story. But that's not the case at all. And so I wanted, again, to widen the scope of this as much as I could and say, okay, well, what are some of the reasons people come to adoption? And how do they create their families? What are some of the backgrounds they have and the feelings that they have about this? And, you know, I really feel like this book is perfect for book clubs for that reason, because each one of these, so basically, it's every three chapters we hear from a hopeful adoptive parent who's outside the family. And we hear a little bit about their history and why they want to adopt. And my hope is that 
book clubs or even people reading this individually will kind of be able to argue with themselves and each other about, you know, who they like and who they don't. Because one of the central questions about adoption that makes it so odd is this idea that we decide who is worthy to, of being a parent. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. But if you have biological kids and you announce that you're pregnant, nobody says, well, why did you want to have a baby? Right? They just say, congratulations. When do you do? And we don't say, well, what makes you think you'd be a good parent? Can I see <laughs> your past three years of financial records? Can we sit down and have a really intimate conversation about your sex life with your partner? But that's what happens to adoptive families. So again, like I really wanted to to interrogate this question of like, how do we figure out who's a good parent and what makes a good parent in your opinion? And that's very central to the adoption question. And I think that's something that even if you don't feel a particular tie to adoption, it's an interesting question to think about and discuss as you read the book. I think that's exactly right. And it was such a widely different group of people, you know, each application or each, I guess, each section about why they wanted to adopt was so different from the next one. It was really interesting. I had to kind of go back and compare and contrast some of them. Yeah. And that was, I mean, one of the things that I did, obviously, I drew on my own experience, my own research, my own experience for researching this book. But I also talked to a lot of other adoptive parents and adoptee and adult adoptees and hopeful adoptive parents. I did a lot of reading of memoirs and books about adoption. And it really is just stunning to me all the reasons that people come to adoption and all the different ways in which we create family. And, you know, what works for one family does not work for another necessarily in both, you know, wonderful ways and difficult ways. I think that's been such an interesting thing that I've seen with my kids as they've gotten older and they spend time with other families. Every family's rules and the way they do things and the way they interact with each other is so different. And so they'll come home and be like, well, you know, we do it this way and they do it that way. And we'll kind of sometimes talk about some of those things. And it is just so amazing how every family unit is so different. It's totally different. And every family has their own language, right? Their own little sayings that they use, their own ways of communicating. And one of the funny things about adoption is, so if you think about it, if you get married, for instance, right, which is a common way to join two families, you generally meet the person that you're going to marry and you spend some time with them and your values are in agreement or the way you see the world is in agreement, your sense of humor is in agreement. And then you meet their extended family and you probably have some things in common with them too. But adoption is funny because you really are just kind of thrust together. I describe it as more of an arranged marriage. I think I, I gave that to one of the, the characters in the book because you're just kind of thrown together and it's like, okay, well, our family does things this way. Oh, well, guess what? Our family does things this way. And you need to figure out a way to make that work because you are raising a child together and uh, you need to make sure that they're getting consistent messages. One of my friends used to always say, she'd say, this is the way we do it in our house. In our house, we do this. You know, when her kids would complain, well, you know, Patsy's family gets ice cream every night. Well, this is the way we do it in our house. And so I think you just kind of, you kind of have to, to do that. But when it's family, as you see in this book, there's an air of complexity that comes along with that. Most definitely, because they are all related in a manner. And so you can say, this is how we do it in our house, which is an expression I actually often use myself. But it's a little more difficult when you have all of these children that are connected to each other. And so you, you have to kind of, it's a fine line. You have to walk a fine line. Right. Because it's not like, I mean, you can't, you can say that about one of your kids' friends who you're going to, you know, run into their, them periodically, but like these people are living together for two weeks <laughs> and are going to be in a relationship together, a family relationship together for the rest of their lives. Right. I mean, you know, the kids will turn 18 at some point, but that doesn't mean you stop being family and you stop being parents. So it's very easy to say, okay, well, you just do what you want, but it's a dance. It's a, a, a dance and you have to figure out the choreography and be gentle with other people's feelings and other people's value systems while you're working together to raise these children. No, that's certainly the case. There is so much humor throughout this book. And as I was flipping back through it again this morning, I literally was laughing out loud again. Are you funny in real life? <laughs> 
I guess <laughs> I try to be. I certainly I gave Elizabeth my sense of humor, I think, in this book. And maybe Ginger. I was like, Ginger was the one that I just over and over again was cracking up at her thoughts. Yeah, I I, I do. I mean, I think that this is it's funny because my first book, The Weird Sisters, we got, you know, author blurbs, which are those little quotes you see from other authors on the cover. And one of them came back and was like, oh, this book is hilarious. And I was like, really? <laughs> I didn't mean for it to be hilarious. But then I would read sections of it when I was doing public appearances and people were laughing. And I was like, oh, I guess it is funny. And so now that is something that I intentionally put in there, because I don't know, I like that. I'm not a person who can manage, like, I want to think about serious issues. And I want people to read my books and think about those serious issues, but I don't want it to be a slog. Like I think about that book that everybody's so bonkers about, A Little Life. Oh, right. Everybody's talking about it. It's so amazing. And I read like a plot summary of it and I was like, oh my gosh, this sounds like the saddest thing in the world. I don't want to read that. Um, so for me, it's kind of like about revealing the dark with the light right? I mean, people aren't serious and sad all the time, except for in that book. <laughs> and people aren't happy all the time. And I feel like putting them together brings out the contrast of both. And this is I mean, they, they are a family. And I think that there's that that joy and happiness and humor in families, as well as those more difficult conversations. Well, I'm on board with the not wanting to read something that's terribly depressing. I feel like we're dealing with enough already. I don't need to then pick up something that's just going to make me cry the whole time. I think it's wonderful to read about harder topics and to learn about different things, but I love having the humor sprinkled throughout because it definitely just makes it a much more enjoyable experience. Right. I hope so. And I mean, God bless everybody who loves that book. And I certainly do read weightier books too. But in terms of what I want to spend my time creating, I definitely want to have both of those pieces in there. I appreciate that. Well, let's talk about your gorgeous cover and how you came up with the title. So the title, I actually should look because I sent a sample of this to my publisher. I, I sold it on three chapters. And so I wonder if I had a different title at that point. But I think the title came pretty early. I played around with some other things, but they all ended up uh, sounding like thrillers. Like I think I played with the perfect mother for a while, <laughs> but that sounds, doesn't that sound like a domestic thriller? It definitely does. And I, and I liked any other family because it has two meanings, right? You know, this family is just like any other family, even though they are different in a lot of ways. And also there are times in the book when they wish they could be in any other family rather than this one. Um, so I, I just kind of uh, stuck with that. And the other thing that I've learned, people thought The Weird Sisters was such a great title, but it gets, like, people say it wrong all the time. People are like, The Wicked Sisters or The Three Sisters or something like that. So I'm like, no matter how good the title is, somebody's going to mess it up. And then, yeah, the cover is gorgeous. And that one, they sent it to me and I was super surprised at first. I think the yellow kind of surprised me. And I was like, I don't know about this. <laughs> but I took the weekend to think about it. And I was like, no, I love it. And if you look at the flowers, the flowers on it. So first of all, the flowers in it refer to something in the book, which I won't, I won't talk about. But also, it's just such a nice way to visually express these different families that are still part of the same whole, these little arrangements that they have on the front of the book. So I love it. I love it too. I loved it before I read the book. Like when I first saw it, I was like, okay, I have to read that book, no matter what it's about. But then after I read the book, I really love the three different vases. Obviously what you reference, the flowers have a, a part of the story. I mean, there's a story related to the flowers. Right, right. And then that each arrangement is different. I just thought all of it really spoke so much to everything that happens in the story. Right. And it's really, that is, I remember with my first novel, you know, they, they said, okay, listen, we want you to go to a bookstore this weekend and we want you to sort of like write down titles of covers you like. And I literally was like, isn't there someone more qualified? <laughs> I am not a visual person at all. And I 
was like, okay, here are book covers I like, but it's really hard for me to be able to distinguish between a book I like and a book cover I like. So I, you know, God bless these designers who are so amazing and who have this way to visually translate a story into an image. And this one, any other family is interesting because it is so clear how it relates to the story. I think after you've, after you've read it, it's very clear how it relates to the story, but it also just works. As you said, it's just kind of an arresting visual. So I love it. I'm so grateful for it. I love it too. I mean, I focus on covers a lot and I am very picky about them. So it's hard for me to pick up a book when I don't like the cover. And sometimes I will go ahead and read a book. It doesn't make me like the cover anymore, (laughs) even if I like the book. So I I just sometimes I'm like, oh, but this one I thought was just perfect. And then it was wonderful once I read it and looked back at it. I was like, oh, it means even more. Right, right, right. Yeah. So I have one other quick question about your writing that's going to have to be tricky because I want it to be spoiler free. But the ending, did you know how it was going to end before you wrote or did you decide that as you were writing? How did that work for you? That's a really good question that I'm not sure I know the answer to. I think I knew how I wanted it to end. And so I, if, if I didn't know from the start, I figured it out very early because I was always writing toward that ending. And again, because I wanted this to be a book that was a conversation starter, I knew I wanted the ending to allow that conversation to go on. That's a great way to word it. I was, I was afraid that was too spoilery. I was trying to figure out how to ask that question and talk about it without giving anything away because you certainly don't want to ruin the ending. But okay, good. Well, I was curious if that was something that you were writing toward the whole time or as you wrote, you thought, okay, this will be the best way for it to end. Yeah, I think it, you know, I'm constantly outlining and re-outlining as I write. And so I always have somewhere I'm aiming. In some cases, I think with my first novel, I thought the ending was going to be one thing and I'd actually written it and then changed my mind as I was writing. I was like, oh, that thing doesn't need to happen because these other things happened. Um, With my second novel, I knew where I was headed and where this one, I knew I was headed. I think, I want to say it's like Joyce Carol Oates or somebody says, You shouldn't start writing until you know the last sentence, which is a very, you know, smart thing for Joyce Carol Oates to say, but I'm not Joyce Carol Oates. But I think that I'm always aiming and writing towards at least a feeling, if not a specific event or a specific sentence. Well, I thought it worked very well and I really liked it. And it's one of those things that makes you think. Good, good. That was the goal. Good. Well, before we wrap up, what have you read recently that you really liked? I know you mentioned one book already that we're going to talk about, but what all have you enjoyed? Yeah, I actually I actually had a really good uh, streak for a little while. I don't know if you go through stages where I have this happens to me all the time where it's like just nothing is hitting me right or I'm not in the mood for it. But I actually had a really good streak. So I read a wonderful uh, book. It's a memoir by uh, another Colorado author. Her name is Erica Krauss, and the book is called Tell Me Everything. And it is about her time as a private investigator on a case against the University of Boulder. And if you read about the book, it, you'll sound like it's so depressing. And it is a very serious topic, but it's fascinating. And I just, I couldn't put it down. The Foundling by Anne Leary. Are you an Anne Leary fan? You know, I have not read Anne Leary, but I keep seeing that book everywhere. And I saw that it was just on the Indie Next list. So I need to grab it. Yeah. So my my favorite book by Anne Leary is her previous one called The Good House. And this one is very different. And when I read about what it was, I thought I was like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to like this. And I could not put it down. And I'm not even sure I could tell you why I couldn't put it down. Like she's that deft a writer that what she's doing is kind of invisible. And then I read an older book called Red Hook Road by Islet Waldman, which is a fa- it's a family story set over 4 years and that was that was super engaging as well. I think The Myth of Surrender which I mentioned earlier by Kelly McNeese is just a perfect companion to my book. I actually hope I can do an event with her at some point because our books are really in conversation with each other and it'd be interesting for us to talk about it. It's always fun when that can happen to either two fiction pairings or a nonfiction and a fiction pairing. I think that really does enhance the conversation. 
Yeah, it really it really can. And I think it sometimes illuminates things about the other book that you're not aware of initially. I think that's exactly right. And back on the Anne Leary book, I had avoided it because the subject matter didn't sound that appealing to me. But if you're saying it's a page turner either way, then I will go back and pick it up. Yeah, yeah, I do. I do recommend it. I mean, you know, you always start it. I'm a big book non-finisher. I am too. Like if I read, you know, five pages, 50 pages, and I'm not into it, I will just drop it and (laughs) move on with my life. Life is too short for books you're not enjoying. Oh, I'm that exact same way. And as you mentioned earlier with the streaks, that happens to me all the time. I will read three or four that are so good. And then I will pick up and put down, pick up and put down. And I'm like, I just can't find anything that's really good right now. And then it will kind of go into a new streak as well. But that seems to happen to me on a regular basis. Right. And sometimes I don't know. I also, we also have this new question of format. Like I think sometimes I'm in the mood for an ebook and sometimes in the mood for a hardback. I don't love reading hardcovers because they're so heavy. So I will very often read those in ebook, read a newer book in ebook form. But I also am a big library user. So I always have library bindings too. So I think sometimes I'm like, I just don't feel like reading a hard copy book right now. I want to read an ebook right now. And I think sometimes for me, it's the subject matter. Like I'm like, oh, I'm going to start a thriller and then I get in a thriller. Maybe I'm not really in a thriller mood yeah. right now or a big family drama or a rom-com or whatever it is that maybe it's just not the right time for that particular book. And I have found when I finish a fabulous book, it's really hard to start the next book sometimes. Yeah, that's that 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 book hangover that people talk about sometimes. Definitely, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. See, I it's not the same for me. For me, I'm like the when if I finish a really great book, I'm like, "Yeah, bring on the next one." <laughs> I guess I'm both. And so it really has to be another really good book, and I think if it's not, then it suffers because I finished this really great book like any other family. Exactly. Well, thank you for that. Well, Eleanor, thank you so much for joining me today on the Thoughts from a Page podcast. This was so much fun. Likewise, thank you so much for having me. You might be surprised to know that not all serial killers are straight cisgender white men, and the victims of true crime are not a monolith either. She's Wendy and I'm Beth, and together we host Fruit Loop Serial Killers of Color, a true crime podcast. Together we take deep dives into the true crime stories about marginalized and minoritized perps and victims that often go untold. We also provide the context and nuance that these stories deserve. At Fruit Loops, we're serving up true crime with a side of history, society, culture, Culture and some fun. Listen to Fruit Loop Serial Killers of Color on Spotify, Google Play, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much for listening to my podcast. If you like this episode, and I hope you did, please follow me on Instagram at Thoughts from a Page. Consider joining my Patreon group to access bonus content and support the podcast. Tell all of your friends about the show and rate it or subscribe to it wherever you listen to your podcasts. I would really appreciate it. The book discussed in this episode can be purchased at my bookshop storefront, and the link is in the show notes. I hope you'll tune in next time. My name's Adam Sokol, and I'm the host of the Passions and Prologues podcast. Every week, Best-selling authors like Jenny Jackson, Rebecca Mackay, Lisa Scottolini, or Brad Meltzer come on to my show to talk about, yes, their new books, but more importantly, the things that they're crazy passionate about. We've talked about the Muppets, powerlifting, traveling, gardening, home improvement, and so much more. We dig into why these things are their passions, how they inspire their writing, and where they came to fall in love with these random assorted things. Be sure to subscribe to the Passions and Prologues podcast wherever you get your podcasts and check out evergreenpodcast.com to learn more.